Happy Sabbath. It's uh, not the nicest day to be traveling, but it's nice to be inside here, isn't it? You know, I, those of you that have come to these retreats over the years, one of the things that always moves my heart is to see these young people up here. They asked us this morning if we wanted them to... The, the, the deacons, the ushers, they, they're very efficient and they wanted to see if we wanted to take the chairs off so that we wouldn't have to come out until after the choir sang. And I said, absolutely not. I want to be immersed in the choir. <laughs> I just love that feeling. And so it's just great when they all come up here and the stage gets full and they're just all right there, and I feel like I'm a part of it. And listening to the music and just being inspired by the song. But one of the other things that always touches my heart is after 28 years of ministry, doing this kind of ministry, and 24 years of that, we've been doing these family retreats, watching these young people grow up. And, and it, it touches my heart, and I know it touches my wife's heart, because we always talk about this. You know, you've got Michael and Neil up here doing the, the, the offertory. They're 27 and 25 years old. We, Elaine and I had a nice opportunity just to catch up with them a little bit yesterday. They're here. No, oh, they're there. <laughs> Why are they here at 27 and 25 years old? I mean, they, they've moved on in life. They've... They've, they've got great careers, and they're responsible young men. Well, they're here because, not just because they've grown up much of their lives at family retreat, but they're here because they love the Lord. And they love what the Lord is, is seeking to continue to do in their lives. And that's one of the things that just touches my heart. It doesn't matter what these young people sing or what they play, it just touches my heart to see these young people that are, that are up here getting older and older and they're still seeking the Lord. And that's good news, especially for some of us who see as we travel around various places in the world and around this country, as we see the... Well, you know what's happening in the world and it's very disheartening to see the young people seeing them drop off, some of them in our own beloved church. And so it's just an extra blessing. And that always stirs my heart and uh, inspires me <laughs> to get up here with some, some more inspiration other than what I feel God has put in my heart. But this morning, we're talking about living faith. That is our theme. The just shall live by what? Live by faith. That's what Romans 1.17 says. It's the righteousness of God. Whose righteousness? It's the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to faith. That is from one faith decision to another faith decision. It is God's righteousness that is being revealed in those choices because the just shall live by faith. So what is this? What is faith? Well, we know that Hebrews 11.1 1 says, and it's, it's one that we know, and sometimes it's one that we just say, but it says faith is the substance, the substance of things hoped for, so it's the reality. Faith believes in the reality. As Dwayne was praying this morning before this meeting, since he was praying and what he was asking for was in accordance with the will of God, can he believe that it will become a reality? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to become the reality that we see in our minds as we pray, but if we are praying for the will of God, we can know that it will be a reality because God never fails. And faith is the evidence we're already seeing the evidence that's tangible of the things that really aren't seen. But with the eye of faith, we see them because when God says it, and when I believe it, it is going to happen according to the will of God. 
So, do we have living faith this morning? We've got three people with living faith this morning. <laughs> now I understand that that doesn't mean that it just you had to think about that. And sometimes our faith, and we're going to talk about this fairly practically, I hope, this morning. But living faith is a faith that is alive right now. Not a faith that I got when I became a Seventh-day Adventist. Not a faith that I got when I, yeah, you might have gotten it then too, when you were baptized. But it is a faith that is living today. And it's a faith in myself? No. No. It's a faith in God that reveals the power of God. That's what it says, that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. So I hope that for any of us that are struggling this morning, and we all have struggles, don't we? The trial of our faith works patience. We have difficulties. We face things. But I hope that if your faith is struggling this morning and if it doesn't feel too alive, that as we go through this message and through the day, that your faith will take hold by a choice upon the power of a living Christ. I found myself 30 years, 38 years old. My wife and I were both 38 years old. I found myself sitting in a surgical waiting room. UCLA Medical uh, Center. Actually, it was, it was a very difficult day. My wife had been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Both of us were medical professionals. Both of us understood that that is not a good diagnosis. And I was sitting there in that surgical waiting room. We had changed our lifestyle. We were living a pretty healthy life at that time. We were living in the mountains of Montana. It was one month before our 15th anniversary. It's just a week before our 38th anniversary. I praise God that my wife is here today. So you know the real end of the story, but you don't know some of the details. And I'm sitting there in that waiting room she has a tumor that is about the size of a tennis ball. And it has been diagnosed as ovarian cancer. I called one of my dear friends back from my old life at Hinsdale Hospital where I worked in radiology. And I called one of my dear friends who was a fellow elder in the church who was one of the top surgeons at the hospital. And I said to Walt, told him what was happening, and we had a good enough relationship that he just, we could talk about the reality. And I understood that there, sitting in that waiting room that day for hours, I had a 13-year-old, an 11-year-old, and an 8-year-old that day, our children. And I tell you, the devil kept putting thoughts in my mind about what's going to happen to you when what's going to happen to your wife happens to her. You're going to be alone with three children. That's a very overwhelming thought. At least it was for me that day sitting in that waiting room. I didn't really feel like reading magazines in the waiting room. My heart was being constantly pulled to prayer to God. And that day, those overwhelming thoughts, the thought that came to my mind in the midst of all of this, those hours of waiting, is how is your faith? In that moment, as I was being overwhelmed with the possibilities of losing my wife, I heard, and didn't hear an audible voice, but that still small voice speaking to my heart in 
those moments and those hours of prayer and the agony of the thought processes I was going through, I heard this thought. I will never leave you or forsake you. And I knew where that thought came from. It wasn't the kind of thoughts that were trying to hammer me with all the negative information and all the, the possibilities of what life would be like. You know, Jesus said, take no thought for the future. Take no thought for tomorrow because today, what you're dealing with today is sufficient for, for the day. We don't have grace for tomorrow. And I heard those, those words come to my heart. I will never leave you or forsake you. And I took hold of those words and that promise and I took hold of Christ by faith in that moment of time with a, with a seriousness, with, with pouring myself out because at that moment I had nothing on this side to look forward to, only to hold on to Christ. And that was a moment that I had to decide if my faith was going to hold on to Christ. He did not tell me, your wife's not going to die. He did not tell me anything like that. All he said is, I will never leave you or forsake you. Is that enough? I'm asking you, is that enough? It has to be enough. Because if Christ is not enough, nothing will ever be enough. We cannot just find peace. We cannot just hold on when things are turning out my way. That is not living faith. And so there in that surgical waiting room, I believed. And my faith, my choice to live by faith in that moment of agony connected me with Christ and his strength. It connected my fear. Fear. We all have fears. My fear, my overwhelming thoughts of the possibility of being alone. And in the midst of that storm, in my mind, in my emotions, I had peace in the power of Jesus Christ. Peace in the storm. Is it possible? That's a hard question, isn't it? It is possible. Because when we connect our weakness to the enduring strength of Jesus Christ, we have a peace that the Bible calls a peace that's beyond our understanding. A peace that passes understanding. A peace that seems unexplainable because it's not a peace we can generate in ourselves. It's a peace that comes from God. And when we have that peace, we can go through what we have to go through. That we cannot go through separated from the power of a living Christ through living faith. Now I wish I could say to you that through the hours that I sat in that waiting room, that once I got that peace, I never had another temptation. But you know how it is for yourself, don't you? You know how your thought processes work, and you know that another thought can come in. We are not condemned for our thoughts. We are not sinning because we get a thought. It is, when, is what we do with the thought and where the thought takes us. And so the devil did not let me go. He's, he didn't say, well, it looks like this guy's going to just trust the Lord, so let's go work on somebody else for a while. He came back again and again, but I continued to affirm my faith in a living Christ who would never leave me or forsake me. And if my wife dies... He will carry our family through. That's a better thought process to keep coming back to than if she dies, I'm going to be hopeless. 
I'm going to be useless. I'm going to be lost without her. That's where the devil wants to take the thoughts. And so, as the hours passed, the lady at the reception desk, who continued to get calls from the doctors, she said, eventually when the surgeons are finished, and there were two surgeons in this surgery, there was our doctor, the one who had made the diagnosis, who was the, the, the main surgeon, and then there was the doctor that was a specialist at UCLA Medical Center for containing very fragile tumors so that they don't spill their seeds into other parts of the body. Those two surgeons were there and, and the, the lady at the reception desk said, when the surgeons are finished, they will call me and you will meet them for a consultation post-operative consultation. And so people were leaving the waiting room. Hours were passing. And I was the last one left in the waiting room. And the phone rang. And she said to me, the surgeons are ready to meet you. And I tell you, even saying those words, the devil hit me with, I'm not going to say everything he had because Unfortunately, it probably doesn't take much sometimes. And that's a tragedy too for all of us. But the devil hit me one last time as I stood up and I'm walking to meet the surgeons. He hit me again with these overwhelming thoughts of temptation. But by the grace of God, I held on and I heard those words again. I will never leave you or forsake you. It was an anchor. It was enough. And I chose to continue to hold on to Christ. And when I walked into the room with those two surgeons, the lead surgeon, the doctor that we had been working with, said to me, how can you have peace and be so calm? Those words came out of his mouth. That is what Romans 1.17 is talking about. It's the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to faith. Whose righteousness was revealed? Yeah, it wasn't mine. I had no idea what my face looked like. Okay? But he said, I don't see that look in people's eyes. Often I see the look of fear and terror in eyes. So he hasn't told me anything. He has the first words out of his mouth. And I'll tell you, that was an encouragement to my soul. Because you can't paste on peace. It is God who gives us peace. Our only part, it's a very small part, but it is our part, and it will never be anybody else's part. And that is the choice we make by living faith. To say, yes, I trust you, Father. I believe you will never leave me or forsake me. And that is what creates the power. That is what sustains the shaking legs. Because it's God that works in us when we choose by living faith. And then he said these words. We've got good news for you. Oh, that just sends a chill down my spine remembering that. Your wife does not have Cancer. Now, to this day, yes, praise God. To this day, my wife and I and the doctor, okay, we got to know this doctor. In fact, that, that was a whole other story, but he actually, after we had an opportunity to interact about this faith, because he asked us questions in, in, in the later days that my wife was in the hospital recovering, he came in and visited us. And one of those days he said, how do you have this kind of faith? And we began to share with him together. And he actually invited himself. He said, I've never done this before, but I'd like to come to your house where you live. 
because he found out over time that you know we lived up in the mountains of Montana and lived in this little idyllic log cabin. It wasn't really idyllic, but anyway, the people think that. You know, you live up in the mountains of Montana, and, and, and so it was a log cabin, but anyway, it wasn't even great. But he said he wanted to come. He wanted to bring his wife and find out about how this faith works. Now that is God. Don't ever get this confused, friends. This is God working, not us. We are just cooperating by saying yes to God and being willing to have living faith. Well, that man never ended up coming and seeing us because ironically, this is an OB surgeon, and he was older than us, quite a bit older. In fact, he was near retirement. And we got a call from him later when he was planning to come and visit us. And he said, you're not going to believe this. My wife is pregnant. I mean, here's this surgeon telling us. You know, we're 38 years old. He's, he's I don't know if he was 58 or 59 at the time. And he's telling us, my wife is pregnant. It's changed all of our plans. We weren't expecting. In fact, we were just getting our last son out of college. <laughs> and now we got this little one coming on the way here. It's changed all of our plans. But you know, that's not the point, but it was part of the real story. But we went through some other faith tests in this that we weren't necessarily expecting. And we had other questions. And people questioned us. So, so it wasn't cancer. Well, we don't know whether it wasn't cancer or if God did a miracle. Can God still do miracles today? Okay. All we know it was the size of a tennis ball. And it needed to be taken out. But what we found out in that surgery was that my wife, her whole abdomen was full of endometriosis. And for those of you that don't know what that means, normally if you get... Endometriosis is this stuff that looks like scar tissue that gets all over your organs. And in her case, she had endometriosis that was surrounding her large intestine and surrounding the ureters. Those are the little tubes that lead from your kidneys down to your bladder. They, she was enveloped by endometriosis. And the, the surgeon said, you didn't have any of this pain? The only thing we were in there for was this tennis ball-sized tumor. She didn't have any pain associated. He said, I have patients that have the size of your little fingernail, and they are in excruciating pain from endometriosis, and you are full of it. So thank God it wasn't cancer, but thank God that she was able to get this found out because she was going to have some serious problems from the complications of this endometriosis. We had people come to us that tested our faith, people who were well-meaning friends, and they're still friends today, coming to us and saying, where is your faith? You say you have faith. Why are you going in for surgery? Just trust God. Don't, don't have faith in hospitals. Don't have faith in doctors. Have faith in God. And please, yeah, that, that came out a little bit wrong. But we've seen so much of this. We've seen the heartache that can be caused by what people are going through. And we've experienced the heartache of what it's like to have people who you know love you and they have your best intentions in mind and they're telling you, what's wrong with your faith? Doesn't make you feel very good. That was a test of our faith. But friends, we knew what God was asking us to do by faith. And that is important. You need to know what God is asking you to do. And if you get pulled by everybody, I mean, I can't tell you how many. I can't even remember how many people told us cures that would cure this. And we'd never have to go to a doctor. I, I'm serious. We probably, and I'm not even going to tell you how many, but we had people calling us, sending us stuff, special remedies, if we would have tried all of those things, we were doing natural things that, that as we were reading the spirit of prophecy, but you have to know what God is asking you to do. And we knew what God was asking us to do. You see, our faith was in God. It was not in ourselves, and it was not in other human beings. 
No matter who they were, how much they knew, it was in God, and that needs to be the living faith that we have. And so, we had a faith in a God that we believed loved us with an everlasting love. Do you believe that? Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know, I used to ponder on that. Is this because God is kind of a hard person to get along with? Is this because God is so high that he's got to have everything just, just like he wants it? You've got to check all the boxes because if you don't get it right, this is what a lot of people believe. But I've come to recognize that this is not because God is a hard God. It's because God is a God that can do anything and everything and all things are possible through him. And the only thing that keeps him from doing many things is that he doesn't force us. And if we don't believe that he is God, and I, I, I was thinking this morning as I was going over this message and, and praying, I had this picture of my son when he was about two years old. It just popped into my mind. And he was up in a tree. And he was in a difficult position. And I said to him, jump, and I will catch you. Actually, I said, Daddy will catch you. <laughs> and you know what he did? Got quiet, didn't it? <laughs> he jumped. And I caught him. You see, if he couldn't trust me, as his dad to jump in that situation, he wouldn't have jumped. It wouldn't be, be any, anything because I couldn't catch him. It would only be because in his mind, he didn't trust me. He didn't really believe that I could catch him. And so when God says here, inspired the words, without faith it is impossible to please God, He's not saying that he stands there waiting for us to get a certain attitude and a certain kind of, and work it up to something. He's just saying, simply believe that I can do what I say I can do. If you can trust me, if you can have living faith in this moment, I can do it. If you can't, it's not because I can't do it. It's because you won't let me do it. You don't believe that I can do it. And so when we come to God, we must believe that he is for he that comes to God must believe that he is God and that he is the rewarder of them who diligently, who wholeheartedly seek him. You see, this, is the, this takes us back to the part that is so important for us. As professing Christians, as living Christians, we either have living faith or dead faith at any particular time in our experience. It is not a once living faith, always living faith, and it is not a dead faith, always dead faith. We make choices in the day. And I, I really, I'm so thankful we have Romans 12, 3 that doesn't give any of us any excuse, well, I don't have faith, or I don't have enough faith. It says in Romans 12, 3, that God has dealt to every man, every person, a measure of what? So he's given a measure to all of us. There's nobody that, that doesn't get some faith because God is God. So we all have at least a mustard seed worth of faith. It doesn't matter how much or if we can measure it. What matters is what we do with it, okay? But here's what happens. And it really helped me as I began to understand it is our choice. It is the only part that we play in the plan of salvation that is so important while it is so small. It is our choice that activates living faith. It is our choice that deactivates it and kills our faith. And that's what James is talking about in James 2.20. It's dead faith. It's faith that doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? 
It's because we deactivate it. We deactivate it like this. No. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. Children, you deactivate your faith. You turn your living faith into dead faith when you're riding your bicycle and having a great time and mom comes out and says, it's time for you to come in and help me fold the clothes. And you don't want to get off your bike. And so what do you do? You negotiate with mom and you start killing your faith. You start deactivating your faith. It's no longer living faith because now you want to do it your way and not what mom's asking you to do. Or it might be somebody on your device and dad says, you know, son, daughter, let's just put the device down. Let's just leave it for mealtime. And that young person's a little bit device addicted and I can't. What do you mean you can't? Well, I got people that are trying to text me and, and okay, this is a real conversation. That's deactivating your faith. You don't have living faith anymore in that moment. I'm just giving you simple examples. And we all do it. We all make choices that either activate living faith and we go from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. We either reveal the righteousness of God, which is from one faith choice to another faith choice, or at some point we decide not to. We deactivate the faith. It becomes dead faith. And in that moment, it doesn't work. It's not God. Our faith goes dead. We've deactivated it. When the devil hit me with that last temptation, walking to meet the surgeons, and he tried again to overwhelm me with those thoughts, if he had gotten me, and I wish that he hasn't gotten me as many times as he has, but he didn't get me in that situation, I praise God. But if he had gotten me there, that surgeon would have never said, how come you have such peace? That surgeon would have seen the sorrow in my eyes. The surgeon would have seen the fear in my eyes. The surgeon would have seen the thoughts behind those eyes that were saying, my wife's probably going to be dead in six months and I'll be without a mother, without a wife, my children. What am I going to do? That's what he would have seen in my eyes because my faith would have been deactivated and it would have been dead. God wasn't dead. But praise God, we can activate living faith by a choice that we make. And 1 Peter 1, verse 5 says that we are kept by the power of God. What keeps us? The power of God keeps us. Who keeps us? It isn't our faith that keeps us. It's the power of God that keeps us. It is our faith that activates through a choice. It says that we're kept by the power of God through faith. It's through that tool, through that avenue. Our faith doesn't save us. Our faith just connects us to the power that saves us. And it says we're kept through faith unto to salvation. We had a situation that happened very recently. You know, I, as I shared this experience about the, the tumor, that is, there's nothing human beings can do about those kind of things. We only have a choice to either trust or be swept away with our emotions and our circumstances. But sometimes in those situations, when we become so helpless, it strengthens our faith, and we almost feel like we don't have anything else we can do. But many times when we're doing day-to-day -day things, it's too easy to think that we can do them ourselves. So this was a few weeks ago. We were going to be doing meetings in Clinton, Missouri. Some of you were there. And <laughs> we always appreciate it when friends come from various places when we're doing church meetings in the area. It's always very encouraging. It's great to, to catch up. So we we're going to do meetings in Clinton, Missouri. And uh, we flew in to St. Louis, Missouri. And 
We got our rental car. Everything was pretty normal at this point until my wife put in the address of the church. And she said, three hours and 45 minutes. A little bit like the cookies are burning in the oven. You know, that kind of, there was a little bit of reaction to that. That still didn't really strike anything with me. It's like, okay, three hours and 45 minutes. That doesn't necessarily mean anything to me. She said, it's only supposed to be an hour and a half. Something's wrong. So she tries to make sure she's got the right address in. So we find out that as we're driving, that now we're going to be getting there 10 minutes before the meeting starts. If everything works out well. Now, my wife doesn't know what's happened, okay? So we're trying to figure it out, and she is, she's feeling very stressed at this moment, okay? And sometimes when that happens, I am not the encourager that I could be. Sometimes I might say something like this. These are really true, okay? Okay. <laughs> I might say something like this. So why did we fly into this airport if it's three and a half hours or three hours and 45 minutes? I didn't say that. By faith. No, I didn't even have the temptation. Do you know that sometimes we don't even have to have the temptation? And that was such an exciting thing for me because we've had it so many other times that that is a work of grace through faith. But I said to her, honey, it's okay. She was feeling so bad. She said, I don't know what I've done. I've, I've messed this up. We should have flown into Kansas City. Well, we, I said, honey, I said, you have done, she's our in-house travel agent, okay? She's done this for all the years that we've been in ministry. And I said, honey, you have done this for so many years. And this is the first time anything like this has happened. You've, you're doing great. And I was feeling really good. I wasn't feeling stressed. And I said, it's going to work out all right. We believe that all things work together for good. I don't think she could believe these words were coming out of my mouth. And it's true, isn't it? All these things work together for good. They don't always appear like they're going to work out for good. And then as we're driving along, she's, she's feeling better. She's not feeling so bad and beating herself up. And, and it helped that I didn't beat her up, if you know what I mean. And so we're driving along, and we finally figured it out. She, when she put in the, the, the mileage thing in the Google Maps or whatever it was, MapQuest, the only thing we could figure... And we got a little clue from the guy at the desk uh, at the car rental. So he said, so you're going to Clinton, Illinois, huh? And I said, no, Clinton, Missouri. Oh, never heard of Clinton, Missouri. <laughs> so that, I mean, that didn't, something wasn't quite right there. Never heard of Clinton, <laughs> Clinton, Missouri. Well, what we figured out, and it's the best thing we came up with, is that it auto-filled when she was doing all these back and forth, checking different airports, because she, she checked three different airports. And you'll be happy to know that when we come to your church to do meetings or we come to these retreats, we always try to do it for the least amount on the tickets, okay? We handle it just like we would our own expenses, okay? We know that that's important. So the only thing we could figure out is that it put it auto-filled Clinton, Illinois, which was an hour and a half. And now we're going to Clinton, Missouri, which is three hours and 45 minutes. So we were resting in the Lord. Everything's going to work out all right. One of the stresses for my dear wife, and she's given me permission to share this, was that first time, take 28 years of ministry, first time she said to me, honey, we are going to have to get up so early in the morning, 3.15, to catch this flight, that if I take a shower and wash my hair, I'm going to have to get up at 2.30. So, we've got plenty of time once we get into Clinton, Missouri, 
We've got plenty of time. We'll be in two, three hours before. And we'll have plenty of time. I can wash my hair, get a shower. We can relax, go over our notes. Now we've got 10 minutes before the meeting starts. She says to me, look at my hair. <laughs> yeah? I mean, look at it. She said, how does it look? I said, it looks flat as a pancake. <laughs> Now, that wasn't a discouraging comment. It was an honest comment. She said, that's exactly right. The first time that I decide not to take a shower and do my hair, she said, we're going to be into the meetings before I probably can even change my clothes, let alone do anything with my hair. I said, honey, and I, I was trying to be very understanding because I don't have to, to worry about my hair that way, okay? <laughs> There's getting to be less and less of it up here. <laughs> in fact, my wife always has to help me in the back. She says, that bald spot is getting bigger. <laughs> Used to be she could cover it with my hair, but it's not covering real well. But anyway, I don't have to worry about the hair thing. And so she's feeling bad about that, okay? And I'm trying to encourage her that it's going to work out. And so now we like to keep the, we like to live within man's laws, right? When we're driving. How many agree with that? About 15 people. So anyway, we agree that we should keep man's laws if they don't conflict with God's laws. And so I'm trying to, to, to do my part, okay, to get there as quickly as possible, but do it, you know, in a safe manner. So we're driving along, and see, I don't have to tell this part of the story, but I'm going to be very honest, okay? So we're driving along, and we're going as, you know, about five over, and I see this car coming behind me that is going obviously more than five over. And this car shoots by me, and I pull out behind it, and then there's another car coming that's following that car. And I got between these two cars, and I was just flowing with the traffic, those, the, the, this, those two pieces of traffic. <laughs> and for about 70 miles on this long, empty stretch of freeway, we made up a little time, okay? And so on your GPS, okay, your GPS, it says you'll be arriving at X, you know, X at a certain time. And so my wife would say to me, we just gained another minute. I said, good. <laughs> a little while later, we just gained another minute. Well, we gained 21 minutes, okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. We gained 21 minutes, okay? I'm not sure how all that works, but it's the truth, okay? And, and so we got there, and we actually had about 25 minutes, or 22 minutes, or something like that. And we were able to change our clothes, and my wife figured out something she could do with her hair that I never knew women did, okay? So I learned something new after 30, nearly 38 years of marriage. So we're in this room, changing our clothes very quickly, and she does this. Did you get it? <laughs> she took her hair and threw it forward and threw it back. And she said, does it look better now? <laughs> and I said, it does. That's all she had time to do. She couldn't rewash it. But this is real. Okay, but the point of the story is that because we didn't let go, okay, we didn't let go of Christ in that situation. I wish I could tell you that I never let go, that I never kill my faith or deactivate my faith by my choice. But sometimes in situations like that where it's stressful, I have lost my faith and I have added to the problem in how I respond to my wife. And there is power in the gospel if we connect by living faith that can keep us from that. Do you know that? Have you experienced it? And that's good news. Our text there up on the, 
the banner says that the righteousness of God, well, it doesn't say the whole thing, but Romans 1.17, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. We will always be living by faith as we are connecting our weakness to his strength. And we will always know when we deactivate our faith, we'll know the experience and the fruit we get is faithless. Faith dead. Faith that has been deactivated, and it will be our choice. So, I always, not always, but I like to sometimes do a, a, what I call an honesty check. My wife isn't always happy with, she doesn't always think I should do this, but I like to do this sometimes, okay? So this is actually one that I want you all to raise your hands on, okay? And I know that scares people, Okay? What if my mother sees this? What if my husband sees me raise my hand? This is an honesty check, okay? How many of you here have had a failure of your faith? I'm going to look around. <laughs> failure of your faith. Keep your hands up. <laughs> I'm just going to see if there's anybody that's never had a failure of faith. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to tell you about one of my failures of faith, um, recent failure of faith, not because we lift up a failure of faith, but because God is a master at turning defeats into victories. And unfortunately... We have to do that sometimes because our faith fails. It was a Sabbath afternoon, and of all places, it was at Indiana Family Retreat. I don't mind telling you. Some of you are there, from there were there. <laughs> Indiana Family Retreat. It was a beautiful Sabbath. Sabbath is always a high day at our retreats. Paul had had his 11 o'clock message, the theme message last year. Very encouraging. And now it's youth panel time. And it was an afternoon youth panel there. And so it's youth panel, and sometimes there are difficult questions that the young people have to answer. But this was a situation where the question that was asked, I really felt like it was a bad question. I mean, a really bad question, and actually put the young person in a very difficult position, sort of a no-win position, if they were, to be honest. They actually, you know, it was, it was very hard. And I'm sitting back there, and, <laughs> boy, all of a sudden, I made the choice to say, bad question! Did you hear that? It was about that loud. Now, I'd like to be able to say to you that I, I don't know what happened and I don't know why those words came out of my mouth, and, but we can't make any excuses, right? Or we shouldn't. And so, my dear wife, she is a very dear wife, and she is an one of the blessings of our relationship is that my wife is that striving to be that, that Proverbs 31 woman and she is a refining influence in my life. And I, I say that with all honesty and love. I thank God for the refining influence. And she leaned over to me. This isn't a direct quote, but it was as best I could do on remembering it. She said, honey... I don't think that was a good influence to yell out in the meeting. We have not appreciated that happening in our meetings. I've actually had somebody in a meeting at a retreat come up and push me out of the pulpit because they had a message to give to the people. Now that all turned out good, but it wasn't a very comfortable situation. But. I knew what she was saying instantly because I was already under conviction that what I had done was not 
was not right. So, my next feeling, and that's and the only way I can describe it, and it was a feeling of being horrified. You know that word? Horrified. Not terrified, horrified. And that's a strong word, and it's probably too strong a word, but when the reality of what I had done had hit me, it was, it was just a terrible realization. Because here I am, co-founder, president of Restoration International. And what an influence I am having upon the constituents of this retreat. I mean, you probably can't feel the full impact of that, but as it just dawned upon me, I knew that I needed to go to Paul. Okay? Paul was the moderator. Okay, So I got to go to Paul. That's not very hard to go to Paul. I mean, we have a great relationship. But I knew that, you know, I say bad question in front of, well, I was in front of everybody. I was behind. I say bad question, so that's a reflection on Paul. Why did you let a bad question go through? But that wasn't what I was thinking when I said it. It really wasn't that at all, but it could come across that way. So I went to Paul and apologized to Paul, told him I was sorry, went to, and he's fine, and I knew he would be, and my wife, you know, very understanding. So was that enough? Have I done enough uh, on my repentance and confession? One person said no. This is a... <laughs> Thank you. This is an area that a lot of people get shady on, okay? I know this, okay? By God's grace, we, we raised our family differently than, than we were raised in many respects, and that is in this area. If I yelled at my wife or got upset at my wife in front of my children, I made a commitment to the Lord very early in parenting that if I made a public offense like that that would affect my family, then I would publicly, yes, I would go to my wife and make it right, but, but I would also go to my children if they were affected by that. That is genuine repentance and confession. And it's going there without making any excuse. Because there is no excuse for sin. Do we all agree with that? And so here I am at the Indiana Family Retreat, and now I, but not just me, Elaine and I, are going to be the closing speakers. And so I knew what I had to do. Before the message, I got up and I said, now before we start the message, I said, you know, there was somebody in the audience today that uh, said, you know, bad question. Did you guys hear that? And they almost all raised their hands. And I said, so do any of you know who said that? You. Okay. And so I began to share with them my sorrow for that failure of faith right there in that situation. And I confessed and I repented and I told them how sorry I was and asked them for forgiveness. Because we can learn from these failures of our faith. When we deactivate our faith, we can learn by those failures and we can take those failures and we can turn them around and they can strengthen us for the future. They can remind us of how much we need our Savior in our day-to-day -day lives. And in closing, I'd like to remind you of the man who, as a human being, as a regular father, was tested beyond anybody that will ever be tested on this earth, before him or after him, and that was Abraham. And his test was to be the final test to make him the real father of the faithful. Because Abraham had failed in his faith. He had said, tell him you're my sister. He did that twice. And God had to take him through that refining fire, that refining process, 
And his test is one that none of us will ever face. Take now thy son, Genesis 22, 2. Take now thy son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to a region of Mount Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will tell you. Sometimes we read these stories, and I, I tell you, when I read this story, and I meditate on this story, and I read the inspired commentary, I weep every time I read it, because I have a father's heart. And I see the picture of Abraham with his son, sleeping peacefully, and he's going in. Inspiration says, and he goes in, and he looks at his son, sleeping that peaceful rest, and he turns away, and he goes to his wife, and, and I understand this. He, he wants to say something to his wife. He wants to share this burden somehow, not carry it alone, but he can't say anything to his wife. And three days' journey, he's begging, pleading with the Lord to reveal something. Is there a change? And all those long nights, he's praying all night while everyone else is sleeping. And you know the story. None of us will ever be tested like that. But we are going to continue to be tested. We're going to be tested on things that are not nearly that hard. There are fathers here that just need to learn to spend time with their children by living faith. There are fathers here, husbands here, that need to, to be willing to, to spend time with your wife in communication by living faith. You make time for everything else. I've had to learn and continue to learn these same lessons. There are young people here that are having issues and attitude issues with their parents. There are parents who are turning their hearts of their children toward rebellion because of hypocrisy in the home and pretending to be something in public, which is one of the things that drives young people away from the Lord. By living faith, these are tests that we can bear in the strength of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, verses 6, 7, and 9 says, Greatly rejoice, greatly rejoice, though for a season, if you need, you will be in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Christ, receiving the end of your faith, which is your salvation. Is that good news? Don't expect to get out of trials. Trials are going to come. And in closing, I want to share the song, Refiner's Fire, because God is going to refine us through our trials so that he can bring us to the place of eternal security and salvation. The Refiner's Fire. With sacred heat, white hot with holy flame, and all who dare pass through its blaze will not emerge the same. Some as bronze. And some as silver, some as gold, then with great skill all are hammered by their sufferings on the anvil of his will. The refiner's fire has now become my soul's desire. Purge 
touched and cleansed and purified that the Lord be glorified he is consuming my soul refining me making me whole no matter what I may lose I choose the refiner's fire and I'm learning now to trust his touch to crave the fire's embrace for though my past with sin was etched his mercies did erase each time his purging cleanses deeper I'm not sure that I'll survive yet the strength in growing weaker keeps my hungering soul alive the refiner's fire has now become my soul's desire purged and cleansed and purified that my Lord be glorified he is consuming my soul refining me he's making me whole no matter what I may lose I choose the refiner's fire please choose the refiner's fire just want to take a couple of moments of reflection to think of what the Lord would put in your heart what he has put in your heart what he's brought to your thoughts and then as the piano plays quietly We'll meditate and then close with prayer.
Shall we kneel together as we close? Father in heaven, we want to have living faith. You've never given us any reason to question that you're able to keep us. You've always encouraged us, you've pursued us, and you've demonstrated a love that never fails. Father, I pray that each one of us here would be willing to activate living faith in each choice that we make through the rest of this day. We make many choices from the beginning of this day to the close of this day. And we want our choices to be from faith to faith because then we know that we're revealing your righteousness. Through Christ, in his name we pray.